From the beginning to end of baseball season, weather drastically affects how a baseball moves through the air. So let's raise that weather IQ. Let's play ball. When it's cold and dry out, this is great pitching weather. Curveballs and sliders will have a better break because the air is more dense. The denser air allows for a little bit more drag in the ball, enhancing the spin. But when the batter does make contact, this cold, dense air won't allow the ball to travel as far. Ooh, only making it to the warning track. Cold air has its molecules packed really close together, which slows any object down. <sighs> that was a great hit. This is why there's usually more home runs later in the season compared to early on. That's why you're gonna find the coach calling for the outfield to move in. As the season moves on and the weather warms and gets more humid, the advantage moves to the batter. Balls will travel farther and breaking balls will break less. Warm air is less dense than cold air. The molecules are further apart, so this allows less drag on a baseball's flight. This can add an extra 20 feet onto the flight of the ball. Because believe it or not, it's the humid and muggy air that's less dense than the drier air. It's because the water molecule is lighter than the nitrogen and oxygen that it replaces. So when it's hot and humid, it might not be the best when you're sitting in the stands, but the ball travels more freely when it's uncomfortable. Other effects, sky conditions. When it's cloudy, especially if the clouds are white, you can lose the ball in the clouds. And when it's sunny, the sun can get in your eyes, creating unnecessary errors. <laughs> Lastly, winds. Winds coming from the first baseline favor right-handed hitters, but from the third baseline favor left-handed hitters. Thanks to the Charlotte Knights here at Truist Field, I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy. We're here at the Aerodyne Wind Tunnel, and what are we gonna do? We're gonna demonstrate the power of a hurricane's winds. We're gonna go from tropical storm one, two, three, and then max it out at a low end four at 130 miles per hour. All right, it's getting real. All right, let's experience a hurricane. This is the Aerodyne Wind Tunnel, 250 feet long, 2,500 horsepower. The main thing about this simulator, you don't have the rain, you don't have the debris. This is just showing the pure power of the winds. Okay, let's do this. This would be tropical storm strength. You can walk. Picture this as a strong thunderstorm pushing through the area. But once you get to 74 miles per hour, that's category one. Let's go category one. You can feel the difference. A category one is gonna rip off shingles, roof tiles. Let's go category two. A category two hurricane is wind at 96 to 110 miles per hour. I can't walk forward on my own. Debris can be thrown into windows. I can barely speak. It's an extremely dangerous situation to be outside. Let's go major. Ramp it up to category three. You can feel the difference! You can feel the difference! Roofs can be thrown off! Let's go to the map! This would be Category 4! Both Category 4 and 5 hurricanes produce catastrophic damage and can leave areas uninhabitable for weeks, even months. The power of wind increases exponentially. Just look what it does to my face as we increase the major hurricane status. Cute, right? Something I truly never want to experience in real life, but thanks to Aerodyne for showing us the force of a hurricane. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy, WCC Charlotte. Let's talk ground clouds, AKA fog. We're lowering the visibilities in this week's Weather IQ. Fog is simply a cloud that touches the ground, where depending on several factors can lower visibilities down to zero, making it nearly impossible to see in front of you. Interesting fact, fog droplets are extremely fine, where you can fit one billion of them inside of a teaspoon. Here's what fog needs to form. One, a wet ground where water evaporates into water vapor, then condenses into fog. Two, a clear sky. And number three, calm winds. The most common type of fog is radiational fog, and that's what we most commonly see here. Using dry ice to accelerate the process, picture overnight, you have calm winds and a clear sky. All that moisture at the surface will rise up, evaporate, condense, and eventually forms a ground cloud. If there's no wind, all that fog is just building at the surface, but if you add a wind, it eventually could break up the fog. Some other types of fog, advection fog. Advection means the transport of air horizontally. When warm air rides over a cool surface, fog is formed. This fog is most common on the Pacific coast. This is the fog that you see around the Golden Gate Bridge. Valley fog, this is appropriately named and happens usually during winter. When the mountains cap the air's lift, fog gets trapped in the lower elevations or in the valley. And freezing fog, 
This is simply when fog droplets form and freeze onto solid surfaces. The National Weather Service will issue a freezing fog advisory if this happens. And lastly, fog's worst enemy is the sun. Fog is usually gone by the afternoon because the sun warms it up in the morning, causing it to rise, then dissipate. I hope that cleared the air on fog. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy with WCNC Charlotte. Hail is one of the more underrated weather phenomena, but did you know that it causes over $1 billion in damage to crops across the United States every year? Here's what you need to know about hail. Let's raise that weather IQ. Hail is defined as precipitation in the form of balls or clumps of ice. These bits of ice can range in size from pea size to bigger than grapefruits. Here's a demonstration how it forms. Starts way up in a thunderstorm right around the freezing line, but you need an updraft. Hail size is dependent on the power of the updraft. That hailstone is supported and it goes up and down, up and down above that freezing line. It's picking up super cool water droplets and it freezes. The more that this process repeats, the stronger the updraft, well, the larger that hailstone's gonna get. But eventually, it gets too large to be supported and it falls. If you cut open a hailstone, you can see the rings from this repeated process, just like the rings of a tree. Once a hailstone reaches one inch in diameter or quarter size, it'll start to cause damage to your car and even the siding of your house. At this size, a severe thunderstorm warning will be triggered. However, nickel and penny sized hail can still be a menace for leaves and crops. Most of the hail we see here locally will be pea size or a quarter of an inch. So when we reference hail, we always compare it to everyday objects. When a hailstone is baseball size or 2.75 inches, it can fall to the ground at 100 miles per hour. The world record hailstone fell in Vivian, South Dakota back in 2010, which is roughly the size of a volleyball or eight inches across. North and South Carolina have the same record hail size at 4.5 inches, which is about the size of a CD. When a hailstorm is overhead, get inside and stay away from windows because hail can blow sideways. So stay safe this severe weather season. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy. The cap, not this cap, nor that one, but we'll use this as an example later. The cap can prevent storms from forming, so you know what time it is. It's time for another Weather IQ. The cap is a warm layer of dry air that can range anywhere from the surface up to 10,000 feet. Depending how strong the layer is, it can prevent a single storm from forming, even when the atmosphere is juiced up perfectly. To understand this, let's start with the basics. Thunderstorms form from rising moist air. That warm air meets with the colder, drier air, condensing into clouds and eventually can turn into storms. However, sometimes that rising air gets trapped by the cap. To visualize, this bottle of soda is a super unstable atmosphere where all that heat and humidity is building at the surface. But as long as that cap is tightly in place, it can expand upward. But once that cap breaks, shrubs and severe storms can explode quickly, creating quite the mess. To overcome the cap, temps need to warm up warmer than the inverted layer. Once that happens, the developing updraft is no longer capped and can freely rise upwards. This is why often during the summertime here, you don't see storms develop until later in the afternoon, once the cap breaks. The cap is notorious for busting forecasts, where a day of severe storms can turn out to be a quiet day, or the timing of storm development can be skewed if the cap takes longer or less time to break than anticipated. The cap is also known as a temperature inversion. Temperature inversions are common, especially in the morning and the evening. When they're shallow, they can trap smells and even cause it to remain smoky after a fireworks show because the smoke can't escape upwards. So cheers with another Weather IQ. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy. Wind can be pleasant, where a nice breeze can really enhance the day. However, it can also be treacherous. But how does it form? Let's raise that weather IQ. The best definition for wind is air in motion. The simple answer of how it forms is wind is caused by the change in the pressure, where wind flows from high to low pressure. Let me show you. Here's an example, not scale, of course. This is high pressure and this is low pressure. The bigger the difference between them, the stronger the winds are gonna be. So if there's only a slight difference between the two, the ball doesn't move all that fast. It's a lighter wind. But if you raise the high pressure, lower the low pressure, this big difference is a big pressure gradient, and thus is gonna create a much stronger wind. Wind is nature's attempt to balance the inequalities in air pressure. On a map, areas of pressure are divided by what's called an isobar or lines of constant pressure. The closer these lines are together, the stronger the wind is. So that's why a hurricane has a bunch of these lines expanding from the center. Wind is also controlled by the Coriolis effect or the rotation of the earth and friction. The rotation of the earth deflects the wind and friction such as trees and buildings can slow it down. This is why winds are stronger higher up in the mountains because there's less friction to slow things down. Wind can also form from the sun's energy on a smaller scale. The sun heats the land quicker than water. That air warms and rises. Meanwhile, the colder air from the water moves in to replace it. This causes a wind, also known as a sea breeze. And one more windy note. 
A wind direction is where the wind is coming from. So a southwest wind is coming from the southwest. So stay breezy, everyone. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy with WCNC Charlotte. This is a fun way to learn some weather stats. Here are your Charlotte monthly superlatives. We're going through the months that are the hottest, the coldest, the snowiest, the wettest, the driest, and the windiest in this week's Weather IQ. The hottest month of the year is July in Charlotte, the only month where highs average over 90 degrees. However, the hottest temperature ever recorded was 104 degrees, not just in July. That's happened six times, once September, back to back days in August, and three days in a row from the end of June to start July. The coldest month is January. Lows in January average just below freezing. The coldest low ever recorded in Charlotte is five below zero. This has happened multiple months, hit three times, once in December, January, and February. It doesn't snow a lot in Charlotte, just 3.5 inches per season based on the 30 year average. So January barely wins a superlative over 30 years, but dating back to 1878, February is the snowiest, where the biggest snowstorms have happened all in February. And a bonus fact, the day that it snowed the most is March 2nd. The wettest month is August. This is the only month that averages over four inches each year. On the inverse, the driest month is February, which beats out October for the top spot only by three one hundredths of an inch. And the last superlative for the windiest month is a tie. Both March and April have constant breezes and are prime time for kite flying with an average wind speed of 8.4 miles per hour. As for the best month, well, we'll let you pick your favorite. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy with WCNC Charlotte.